Um, thank you folks so much for coming to the session today. It really means a lot to me that you would give me some time and I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, my name is Anna Marie Syed. I'm an engineering manager. I'll tell you a fact about my last name. It actually means leader in Arabic, but the two most common mispronunciations mean fisherman and happy. So, <laughs> like, it's cool. You can call me however you think that you should pronounce that set of letters. But officially, it's Syed, which kind of rhymes with head, I, I guess. Um, yeah, and so we're going to do a presentation on something that I have a lot of experience failing at, and that's resolving conflicts. All right. So let me know, you know, if you think, oh, she's going too fast, she's going too slow. This is supposed to be a workshop, and so I would love it if you feel safe enough to talk, but if you don't, that's fine. Not everyone, ah, hi. All right, so in case you're not sure what this session is about, I used a bunch of pictures of people playing rugby because gosh, there's so much conflict in rugby. I played college rugby, and, uh, I, but I'm too old now. Um, we're here to talk about how to navigate conflicts that we face on open source teams. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna establish a taxonomy of different kinds of conflicts, and then we're going to look at different solutions or different strategies for solving them, kind of trying to make a table for you. So anytime you face a conflict, I'm going to give them a minute because I get all distracted. <laughs> My friend Petter is going to be the, the session chair here because we're missing someone. Petter is the kindest, best tour guide. If you don't know something about Brno, this guy here knows all of it. So thank you, Petter, and thank you, Martin. And it's so your new faces and familiar faces. I'm really so, so happy. All right. So we're going to try to establish a taxonomy of different conflict types. And you might, I would say, submit a patch. Come up with your own taxonomy. I'm going to tell you the one that I think works best for me with my contacts with open source communities, and I hope some of it will be useful for you. So what we're going to likely do here, I'm kind of discombobulated trying to find something to time myself on. I'm going to try to do taxonomy for 20 minutes, strategies for 20 minutes, and then we can do a practicum where you all try to sort through some conflicts on your own or with me, but really right now, live. All right, I wanted to talk about psychological safety explicitly, and I just, I want you to know that we have different styles for how we feel comfortable participating. This is a group of, I don't know how many you are, let's say there's maybe 25 or 30 folks here. Not everybody is want to talk. That's fine. I know your brains are still working. You don't have to prove it by talking. But if you do want to talk, I can make you some promises. And the first one is that I will listen to you. And I will do my best to make sure that everybody else listens to you. And if we have an unsafe environment where someone isn't listening or is being rude, then we'll address it before we move on. OK? Anyway, thanks for coming. All right. So the reason that I think we should have a taxonomy or like a collection of types of conflicts is because I think that the strategy you decide to use to resolve them will change depending on what kind of conflict it is. So you know with an open source project where you're volunteering, you are deeply invested, your investment can lead you to have a strong emotional attachment. So some conflict comes up and it can feel terrible. It can feel overwhelming. The first conflict I'm going to tell you about, I cried my head off. Um, and if I had kind of known, OK, it's this type. These are the ways I can probably solve it. It would have been healthier for me in the short term. So the main types, 
that we're going to talk about today. The first is interpersonal. That's, you know, you and somebody else, you just, you don't like each other. You bug each other. That's interpersonal conflict. Value-based conflict, that's where you have a set of values. Someone else has a set of values. And you're trying to navigate a problem in common, but your values and their values are not compatible. It happens a lot in open source. Issue or data conflict, that's where you've, you've got a task that you're trying to work on. Everybody understands the task, but you have different ideas, conflicting ideas, about how you're going to resolve it. That's issue or data conflict. Organizational conflict, this is you versus the man, sometimes. This is where it's not between two people. It's you and an entity, or you and a rule, or you and an organizational standard. And then the last type that we're going to talk about today is, I think, maybe the most common, where it's not just a, this is purely an interpersonal conflict or purely a value-based conflict. It's a conflict that has different components in it. And so addressing it completely, you'll need to know different strategies and put them together. So I'm going to go first. I think a good policy is don't ask your audience to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So I'm going to do my exercise here, which says, think of a conflict you are experiencing. What type is it? And I'm going to give you an example from my personal life. Most of the examples in here are from when I was a young woman working on open source, so about 25 years ago. I've tried to pick really old open source conflicts so that if we have investment in them, our feelings have quieted down a little bit and it's easy to talk. But a current one I'm having right now I'm renting a house where I live in Detroit. The piping, the, the piping, the pipes are a disaster. From April 17th until June 7th, I have no hot water. And I have five kids, okay? So my house is a disaster. And I'm trying to rent a new house. The tiny little school district that I'm in has this crazy, like, fractal shape of a boundary. And so I'm having a hard time finding a house I can rent for me and my five kids in that school district. I am saying, kiddos, I love you very much. I'm going to be your consistency. We're switching schools. They are saying, mama, it's from Dubai to America. You have moved. So, <laughs> this is a conflict that I have in my life right now. And we'll talk about it because some of the different strategies here not all, some are. So what do you think? Am I having an interpersonal conflict with my kids where they're bugging me? No, I love them. I mean, you can love people who bug you. That's true. But it's not an interpersonal conflict. Am I having a value-based conflict? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I value not spending my whole paycheck. They value staying with their friends. What will we do? Could also be an issue conflict. We ask to, to move houses, and we don't understand how to cooperate. But it's not organizational. It's not like us versus the man here. The organizational part of this conflict, it's me versus the school district. I said, hey, buds, how about if I move real close and I drive the kid? They said, no way. That's what's going on with my conflict. Does anybody have one that you want to tell us about? Hi. Hello, I'm Tanya. Uh, I can try. I think it's one of the typical conflicts. I did like upstream versus product. Mm -hmm. Oh. And um, uh, dynamics of um, upstream and more flexibility versus stability in the downstream. Ah, beautiful. That's a classic open source conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Anybody else want to tell us about one? 
I would say anything you say will not leave the room, but I didn't know they were streaming this talk. <laughs> so <laughs> in reality, anything you say may go anywhere in the world or to Mars. Thanks, Tanya. You, you have a question. Yes, yeah. Just coming from the Ah, okay. So I didn't, did you say your name? Would you say your name? Stefano. Nice to meet you, Stefano. So I remembered that Martin told me repeat questions, so I'm going to repeat your question. Uh, Stefano is asking about if you have a bias-based conflict, where do you put that? Stefano, you're like teeing me up for my next slide, which is a bias-based conflict. I put it personally, I put it into interpersonal. Um, yeah, can you, so Stefano says, yeah, it depends, maybe, maybe not. Can you explain it more? It could be organizational, right? Yeah, right. You know, when I went to, oh my God, you guys, all right. Or even, or even, or value-based, it could be a lot of things, right? When I went to university, I went to MIT, which didn't have many women at the time, and the women's bathrooms were only on alternate floors. Like if we had to go to the bathroom, we had to like, where am I? Go up a floor, try to find the bathroom, come on down. This was a conflict that was organizational. Yeah. Do you want a based one, Stefan? I don't have one actually, <laughs> but uh, this is just a generic question. I don't have one at the moment. Let me think. Uh, okay, I'll get back. Thank you, thank you. Does anybody else want to say something about biases and conflict? Thank you, Stefano. All right, so let's move on. Interpersonal conflicts at work, where you can't get away from people because they're on your team. This is the most common kind that arises. They usually stem from a personality difference. And when you're resolving this, my big hint to you is that you're going to have to resolve this inside of yourself, right? Have you ever, if you've ever been married as a double divorcee, I can tell you uh, for certain that you can't change how someone else behaves. N not very much. You can maybe change them a little bit. But in order to make some peace with a conflict like this, Usually you have to change your personal investment in it. You can try checking your behavior. You can try changing your expectations. I will tell you, 22 years ago. So picture it, Copenhagen, April 2001. It's Guadeloupe, And I am talking about user interface design. And RMS, Richard Stallman, is in the audience. And I am going on, you know, we're designing this email client, Evolution, it was called at the time. And we're kind of emulating the look of Outlook because we don't want people who are using Outlook to be confused. So I'm talking about UI design and Outlook. And Richard Stallman stands up and raised his voice and said, APIs are interfaces too. And, uh, and it kind of disintegrated there. I went to stone mode like this, and he eventually sat down. But you know, to this day, I have like a hard feeling in my heart. I think, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he thought, I'm famous, I can stand up and talk. Or maybe he thought, this person doesn't look like she knows open source, I can stand up and talk. I'm not sure what he thought. What I thought was, I came to freaking Denmark to do this presentation, and you're interrupting me. And so it caused like a hardness in my heart. So there's one from back in the day of open source for you. Do any of you want to talk about an interpersonal conflict that you've dealt with in your life or at your work or in open source? You can change the names. I think we understand this one, right? You've met people and you just don't get along sometimes. It happens. All right. 
value conflicts. I have such a doozy for this one. I, oh, shoot, patoot, okay. What do we think happened here? Does anybody have a guess for me for how to solve this? Because I legit don't know, okay. Was that you? Did you fix it? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, magic angel, whoever you are. So this happens when people are both invested in something, but they have different values that they've brought with them. So the hints I have, by the way, conflict resolution strategies. I'm just trying to tell you the taxonomy now and give you a couple hints, but we'll do a whole part on the strategies next. So if you feel like, man, you didn't give us any strategies, just please hold your horses. Um, hints for this one, what could help is you know, recognizing that values aren't universal. Clear and explicit about how you explain your values. Just we're trying to move down the quotient from misunderstanding. So that's what we're doing. Um, other thing you could do is learn about what other people value. Those are my hints for this one. So can you tell us about a values conflict that you navigated? Okay. I will tell you one. It's kind of dramatic. In exchange for me telling you one, I hope someone will will also tell me one. Um, ooh, okay. So I'm 46. When I was 31, I was still not married. And in my culture, I'm from a Muslim culture background, in my culture, that was very old. And the people in my community started saying, you need to get married. No one's going to want to marry you. You're going to be an old maid. And I thought, oh, valued getting married at what now looks to me like a young age. So, right, okay. I got married to someone. I moved to the Middle East with them. It was a disaster. It didn't work out. <laughs> but it was divorce number one. Um, this was a hard in not mixing personal values with the values of my culture or the values of my community. Yeah, so now that I've told you about failed marriage and trip to the Middle East. Do you have any value conflict you want to share? I have one in uh, open source. Uh, I'm working on a project where we're trying to get That is a challenging one. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Anybody else have a value-based one? I have one for you. I'm not, you know, I'm a little bit worried that this and I shouldn't share it. It's about X free 86 versus the FSF. <laughs> um, okay. Here's an old value conflict in open source. It's not a perfect match, but I'm trying to show you how it does happen in open source communities. So back in the day, I think 2007 or so, um, XFree86 is going to release version 4.4. And they made a change to their license. They're adding a credit clause, like a traditional BSD license. FSF says this is no longer compatible with the GPL. If you go forward with this, uh, be warned. Well, they went forward with it. They kept their change to their license, 
they lost the majority of their users. So here is a case where licensing uh, is a value that we hold dear and can lead to pretty catastrophic consequences for that project. Uh, I have a yeah. I'm wondering what Cofield's opinions are in this because um, I know that the um, Anthony Mellon and we're quite direct and very, very open. Um, whereas um, at one point I was interviewing someone from India and ah. it was impossible for me to understand his opinions which is very important to me. So by conclusion at the end of the interview, was I don't know. Like based on the interview, the Dutch people, person, I would have said, I will never hire you because you don't have any opinions. But I know that in India, that's different. So but what do you do with that? Oh, OK. Um, I had that one as well. I work for a company called Z uh, on GNOME. And in 2004, I went and I lived in Bangalore. Um, where I was teaching software design. And my first lecture, I put like all kinds of colorful examples. I had John Denver crashing his helicopter and the ballot disaster in Florida. Um, American examples. I hope I had some American centric look. Probably culturally tone deaf. But I thought, oh, they'll be roaring with laughter. They'll be talking to me. And it was so quiet. And I went home and did my normal solution to conflict, which is cry. Um, and it took me a long time. It just took time for me to understand this wasn't disengagement. This was respect. And so with that one, what I ended up doing was noticing how the folks on my team in Bangalore responded to, to share food with me. I remember the last session that I gave there, I had a big God, more American stuff. I had a big bag of American saltwater taffy, and we played Jeopardy. And I found that if I bribed people with candy, they would stand up and shout. So uh, take time, be explicit. I'm expecting to hear you talk about X, Y, Z. Um, those are some hints that I have. Yeah. I will say I read the book, uh, The Coffee Hut by Ben Meyer, and that was very useful to understand at least there was a difference. Ah. Beautiful. How do you spell the last name? Erin Meyer, I believe M E Y E R. Okay. Thank you. So we're getting a for streaming people, we're getting a recommendation to read the cultural map by Erin Meyer. Thank you for your recommendation. All right. Anybody else want to talk about a value conflict? Hi. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that example. For sure, for sure. All right. Let's see what the next one is here. Oh, issue and data conflicts. All right. This is where you have a common task that needs to be solved, and people have perhaps strongly held different opinions about how to solve it. So the example I have from ancient GNOME, um, GNOME 2, we were trying to design the menuing system and we had these, what do you call them, applications, like Nautilus. I wonder, do you know what Nautilus is? You probably do know what Nautilus is because you came to open source development conference, but it's a, it's a file manager. So this name isn't descriptive. So we had a task, right? design the menus, and we had some folks who said, call them by their proper names, and other people who said, 
give them a descriptive name so no one has to know what Nautilus is just so they can go find their downloads folder. Um, in this case, keeping your lines of communication open, trying to not shut those down. You cannot go sulk in the corner quietly and get this one resolved. There is an idiom, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It means you know, putting something out there in the open where the sun can hit it or where our eyes can be on it. That's the best way usually to work on solving this one. Anybody have an issue-based conflict that you want to tell us about? What do I have here? Oh, I already told you. <laughs> when I first started my job at Red Hat, one of my first job responsibilities was to write the status report for my little group. And I love writing. I love creative writing. And so I would write these long status reports that were like all about the ins and outs of our CI travails. And my boss would take them and cut them down, send them up, and I would be like, oh, don't you appreciate my beautiful writing, dude? Um, this was just a case where talking to him, his name was Dominic. Hey, Dominic, what's going on? And having him be really explicit with me. You know, your team is one of many. They, this is not the forum for your beautiful writing. That was a misunderstood task on my part. All right. Oh, -ho. <laughs> I have an Emacs conflict in this one for you to hear about, an organizational Emacs conflict, if you'd believe it. So the point of this slide is to say that are not between people, but they're between a person and an organization an organizational standard or rule or something, um, this can be really hard to resolve because it's not about people, right? It's, it's you and something often much bigger and much more powerful than you. How are you going to resolve that? So what has worked for me the best with this one is finding out where the support lies. So looking for who around me can support me. Maybe we're not going to change the policy, but support me in how I'm feeling. So look for allies so you're not alone if you're feeling this way. Um, sometimes avoiding this is better. Sometimes saying, you know what, this process really triggers me and I don't want to be near it. I am going to go and I'm not going to engage with that. That can also be a way that you help to protect yourself. All right, I'll tell you an ancient one from back in the day. All right, this is from 1993. Um, GNU Emacs was the Emacs standard. And Lucid was also contributing patches to GNU Emacs. And it was getting a little dire for them because there had not been an Emacs release in years. And so they we're creating a fork. We are going to make Lucid Emacs, now X Emacs. We're going to make Lucid Emacs. And then in the future, GNU Emacs, when you accept our patches, we will, we will then merge back into head. We'll be one Emacs once again. But the GNU Emacs folks didn't have that same need. You know, they didn't need to do a release right away, so they didn't. There was this conflict that eventually led to completely different Emacs streams going forward. It was a fork. All right, organizational conflict examples from anybody? Sergey? Yeah, Like you, it, it 
Thank you, Sergey. Thank you, Sergey. That's a really nice example. Anybody else have an organizational one before we talk about the mother of all types, the compound conflict? No? So I have something, but I'm not sure this organizational conflict from perspective of all types of this conflict. Okay. So long story short, you know, we work in development, sometimes we Right, right. Depending on who you asked, if we interviewed him, he'd say it was interpersonal, that guy. Yeah, I really appreciate your example. Thank you. Everything okay, you folks? Uh, yeah, we got so sorry. Okay, I'll ask him to come up and shake. <laughs> all right compound conflicts all right so sometimes a conflict has more than one major source and sometimes this happens because a simpler conflict has gone on a very long time like you should have had your wisdom teeth out when you were 12, Anna, but you had them out when you were 45. So, uh, so I was having excessive headaches because I didn't take care of a small problem 30 years before when I had it. Um, so this can give you an issue, right? This conflict has parts. I don't know which one to address first. Which one is important to address first? How do I deal with this conflict situation? Um, I personally do best with this one when I think about a body metaphor, a human health metaphor, right? One of my kids, he just had strep throat and COVID at the same time. So I didn't have the option to say, no worries, bud, uh, I'll deal with the COVID first and we'll just let the strep throat go on. No, that one had to be dealt with. Um, both of them had to be addressed at the same time. But you can imagine, you know, if you're a hospital technician or a hospital doctor. Someone comes in and she has a gunshot wound to the shoulder and she also stubbed her toe. So I mean, one of these, one of these 
problems has a dire immediate effect on her long-term survival, the other is merely inconvenient. So when you prioritize solving these, you can either start with, okay, what's simple and natural for me? Get that part solved. Then work on what's not so simple for me. Or you can say, look, we've got multiple things at play here, but one is really critical and it's gonna cause us to really break down. Let's try to take care of that first. That's, that is up to you. We have a compound. Would anyone like to come up here, shake hands, and tell about a compound conflict? <laughs> You don't have to shake hands with me if you don't want to. <laughs> Okie dokie, Pinocchio. We'll keep going for now. If you think of one, then just let me know. All right. All right. Resolving conflicts. I was trying to come up with an acronym for you folks. Is that the word? I think it is the word. Yeah. But the issue is that the five strategies we're going to use, two of them start with A, and three of them start with C. So CACA is the only acronym I could come up with, and I felt like you might not take me seriously if I spent the next 40 minutes talking about that. <laughs> so these different approaches are not exhaustive. Some negotiators will tell you there is more five, some people think there's only four, some say seven. I find these five useful. Maybe you will too. I'll just tell you briefly what they are. And what I would ask from you is to think, is one of these natural to me? Do I have like a natural conflict resolution style? Because if you have a natural one, you can lean into that. That's you decide to let them win. You just decide to let it. It's more important to them not that important to you, or maybe you know you you want to show them that you value their opinion, you value openness, you let that one go. That's accommodation. Compromise. Both of you give up something, both of you get something, everyone is mildly unhappy, you can move on from there. That's compromise. Avoidance. Avoidance is we're gonna turn away from this conflict we're gonna leave this one unresolved. It is sometimes appropriate to say we're gonna leave this unresolved. Like if the people involved in the conflict, if they're not the best ones to try to solve it, then for them to leave it and let someone else resolve it, that's an example of when avoidance for them is, is more healthy. Competition. Competition is when the more powerful party sort of puts the smack down and says, you know what? The solution is this. Now we're done with this conflict. Move on. Also, it's sometimes appropriate. Collaboration is like the holy grail of conflict resolution. It's the only win-win uh, in this whole set. And that's where you say, OK, we are going to work together to craft a mutually beneficial solution together. And you know, sometimes it works. So my natural tendency is probably compromise and a little bit of accommodation and a little bit of competition. Do any of you folks want to share? Sergey. Yeah, uh, like compromise and resistance in one that is uh, Yeah. 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 Yeah
come up here. I'm so sorry, I keep forgetting that. Sorry, streaming friends. Stefano is saying that he really doesn't like avoidance as a strategy because he believes it can make conflicts grow into compound conflicts. Thank you. Steph? I wanted to ask on that. Like several or some of them just delay the conflict. Maybe that issue is solved, but it delays it to another, in particular avoidance. But I know there's also things like accommodation. Yeah. Yep, Steph is noticing that many of these strategies don't, don't effectively resolve the entire conflict. They maybe resolve part of it, they postpone some of it. But you know, Steph, there are times where an immediate resolution has to happen. And so we, you know, we end up saying, all right, we're going to have to go with something like the competition strategy, which is definitive and final because we can't let this drag on anymore. Other times, other times, a little bit of space and time between people is healthy. But I think Steph makes a good, yeah, thank you. Anything else? Yes, sir, in the back. Yes. Yeah, wow. Did you say Roberto was your name? Alberto. Alberto. Alberto asked if time is a consideration. Time is a big consideration. Like collaboration as a strategy usually happens after a conflict has sat around for a long time. You found out there's no solution to it. Leaving it isn't making it better. That is when collaboration is more common because you've spent so much time trying to find other solutions that haven't worked. You know then, all right, we're both going to have to build something new. Um, time also comes into play a lot with avoidance. Maybe it's not appropriate to have it solved right in that instant. And so avoiding the issue is uh, because it gives you time to cool down, right? Sometimes people have such hot tempers that the healthiest thing is to say, Let's put this on ice for a while until we're able to talk about it without being rude or hurtful. Do you folks, if you're trying to resolve a conflict, is it helpful for them to know which one you're doing? I would say, Karen, that with accommodation, uh, you know, if you're going to let them have their way, sometimes I feel tempted to say, like, hey, we're doing it your way this time, but, yeah. <laughs> and that, I don't think, is very helpful, you know? But, but what, Anna, really? Yeah. taking accountability. You're saying I'm accountable for this one. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Okay, I have a question. I see folks making for the door. I thought this session went until 150, 150. Does it go to 120? No, 150. Okay, cool. Okay, so we still have some time. That's good. 
And uh, this, I have got a couple of slides here that just go a little bit more into these types. So accommodation is lose-win, right? One person loses because someone else wins. So you end up using this the most if you want to show that you're fair or you, you don't want to be a dictator and shut down someone else's opinion. So you're trying to get them to express their opinion. You might in that case say, okay, let's make this decision the way you want to make it. If it's more important to one of you than the other one, then you might want to go for accommodation. It matters so much to them, it doesn't matter that much to you, so you can accommodate. Or if the relationship is more important than whatever the issue is. So that's accommodation. Does that one make sense? Yeah. Compromise. All right. This is we both win and lose. So win, lose, win, lose. Someone will give something up. Both of you will give something up. Both of you will get of your point. Let's see. We've kind of discussed about this. So it's best used when everyone has equal power, right? So if it's like me and the CIO, CEO of my company, does he want to compromise with me? No. Is that even healthy? My scope of control is rel upgrades and conversions. His scope of control is something much different than that. It's probably not healthy for us to compromise. Um, sometimes for a temporary resolution. Alberto, I think, in the back was asking about timing. Yeah, compromise can work in the short term. We can really solve this now, but let's make something good enough so we're not stuck. So that's compromising. Anybody love compromising? Is it anybody's favorite strategy? Yeah, can you say why? It's because ideally both sides get something. Yeah, ideally both sides get something. What about you? Uh, I want to say I personally find compromising, but I know multiple people who feel it's almost the worst thing because the approach it is from like everyone loses at the end. It's better to give like at least someone gets what they want because in this case no one is truly fully happy. Ah, right, right. That makes sense. It's fine. It works for me. I mean, I'm fine, but I've heard this so many times from other folks uh, that those two represent uh, other <laughs> opinions. Thanks for sharing both opinions. I say there's the two ladies here in the back. The lady with the green glasses was had her hand up first. <laughs> Yeah. Someone was not happy with the uh, resolution, and then um, that turned into another conflict. So my question would be: So how do you handle this new conflict that comes from an old compromise solution? So ultimately, usually with something like that, where it keeps coming up, keeps coming up, coming up, usually you have to collaborate in if you actually want it to be solved. Yes. If you both haven't put something down, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Petra is trying to tell me something. <laughs> uh, the, the question was, does compromise have to be you both lose something and you both win something? Is it win-lose, win-lose? I guess if you're incredibly fortunate and you find a solution uh, that you didn't, either of you need to lose something, then yeah, that would be win and win. Yeah, now we're being. Why, why would you call it compromise? Just for me. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my definition. That would be called collaboration. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. thank you. Um, I was going to ask to pass the earlier comment about complex commerce again. That's more common with um, the previous one, the accommodation. Yeah, so the question here was does accommodation actually solve the conflict forever or does it make it come back again and again? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe Sergey and I, we make our, <laughs> I, maybe we make one decision about lunch and then next week we have lunch again and we have to revisit that. It can. Or, you know, if it matters so much more to them than it does to you, you can let it go in your heart. You can say. Yeah, but it's not like a personal problem. Right? Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Accommodating can definitely lead to resentment and avoidance. Yes. So I want to ask and be directly for the, the discussion. Just at which moment and how do you feel the conflict resolution in case of compromise or you know delay accommodation and so on? Because we, we had this example somewhere where that conflict comes back and this is what often happens. Let's say you have for example a team of seven people and they need to accomplish something. And probably the most common you know, statistic in the resolution will be compromise because you cannot make all seven people happy. This is, you know, there is very unique and you are lucky if you manage. But then what happens in reality? You have a meeting, you discuss this stuff, you do breach compromise, so you close the meeting, you leave the meeting with the thought that I seal the deal, everyone, you know, is agreed. Not, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not really happy with what we discussed, but like that. And then it makes you realize that you, you didn't really solve any conflict, you just deferred it. Because people, you know, people were, maybe they were tired of discussing it all over, so they were just, ah, whatever, let's compromise and move forward. But they immediately come back to you. Ah, uh, we're hearing about the painful and probably familiar situation where you thought you decided it was in the meeting and nobody actually really agreed. My advice, and I'd love to hear what other people's advice is, my advice is at the beginning of the meeting, be crisp about you're going to decide X, Y, Z. Our mission is to decide X, Y, Z. Take notes during the meeting. Record what the decision was. Make sure before you leave that people see what you have recorded. At least here in this situation, there's less room for interpretation. More, do you guys have more thoughts? What, what can do in that situation? Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What, what do we have this time in the island to implement a decision framework? <laughs> uh, we are. Yeah, the, 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 the difference is uh, the very interesting with the uh, I, I wanted to mark a point that just uh, put on the table that is transparency and uh, as uh, you are saying in the beginning, and that these are really 
guarda che si chiama Nuovo Cristiano, and also I would add uh, be very clear on the rules right. of how the decision will be taken. So time is very important, but also are we voting in the end? Are we contributing? Are we set down uh, all the contribution and uh, put two days uh, for the final decision to get the contribution? And who is the final decision taker? Stefano is talking about uh, being crisp and clear up front about what the process will be. Some people, they use a racy matrix where they say, this matrix describes who's responsible, who's accountable, what does C stand for? I don't remember. Uh, consulted. consulted, who will be consulted and who will be informed. So having a really clear description of roles and rules, that can also help to make the compromise. At work, for some matters where we need acts and knacks, uh, you know, we, this decision is gonna need three acts, three, I guess it stands for acknowledgement probably. Uh, so that's like a voting mechanism. Yes, friend in the back. I want to put maybe throw a bomb on the last, you know, Stefan's point. Is transparency going to make me any happier if I don't like the outcome? So if there is a if there is a decision to be made that I don't like, am I as a person affected going to be happier or more? Yeah, the, uh, the <laughs> frozen pizza scenario has grown and become <laughs> the, the question or the, the comment is about transparency not necessarily yielding happiness. If I thought I had a stake in this decision and I don't win, I don't get my way, then does the transparency help me? Would I have been happier if someone said, hey, we're going for tacos, and I didn't feel like I had a vote? Maybe, maybe. I think my advice here would be understand and sign off on the decision framework that you're participating in. Believe it's legitimate, or participate in something else. The, the summary of this one would be, I think the summary is, thank you. I think the summary is be mindful of how much detail is meaningful when you're communicating a decision 
not always complete detail of the entire decision log might not always be the best. My question for folks is, we have about 15 minutes left and we've got a couple more strategies to talk about, including this one, which I think you're not gonna like. This one is avoidance. Would it be okay to move on to avoidance now? <laughs> <laughs> Should we avoid the avoidance slide? <laughs> All right, so nobody takes action to resolve the conflict. And so we think of this as lose-lose. I didn't get my way, you didn't get your way either. So the conflict is unresolved. But kind of the question is, why the heck would you ever want that? When would that be better? And it actually is better sometimes. So timing is a constraint, right? If all of us know keep wasting time on it, we're never going to move to the bigger, more important issue. Okay. Avoid that one. You don't need the fuss of not being able to solve it. Focus on what's more important. And avoidance is okay. That conflict didn't help us. If, <laughs> sorry, it's just being divorced twice. I have some experience with this one. Um, when the people who are involved need a chance to cool down and spend time apart. You know, it's not actually true that you should resolve everything in that minute. Sometimes your feelings are hurt. They are hurt. You can't hear each other anyway. If you need time, it can be okay to say, let's table this. For now, you just have the right scope of authority to resolve this one. Maybe someone else is better able to resolve it. Like, kids are playing with a doll. Someone rips its head off. Now they can't fix it anymore, and they're really mad. They probably can't resolve that. Probably someone else, more empowered, with an engineering background like me, <laughs> should resolve it. Um, Sometimes, this is a hard one to explain, sometimes the impact of dealing with the conflict is going to damage everyone involved. You can solve it, but it's going to hurt everyone. In your head, and you see, we're all going to get hurt if we do this, then it might be better to avoid it. So those are some cases where we'd like to avoid a conflict. I had this once in a document I was writing. It was a document uh, for a promotion, so people were going to vote on it. And a reviewer said something, and I did not agree with them, and they did not agree with me. And it became a painful situation. You know, in the end, what we decided to do was, let's move. The person who is the decision maker can see the conflict and decide, but for that reviewer and I to keep going back and forth, so we avoided it. Anything else on avoidance? Yes. Um, I would just say that the first one, when the issue is a minor one, I think it's usually naturally happens this way if both parties think that it's minor. In, in my experience, very often one person thinks it's a minor, but other person thinks the opposite, and that's why conflicts continue, even then when one Ah, that was a beautiful comment about we don't always know how much a conflict matters to someone else. Maybe we think we can ignore it, but it, to them it wasn't. Thank you. Yes? Um, I also have a lot of people when I feel like I'm not being heard in the early discussion. So like earlier you mentioned the having a discussion and people not being heard, then I start avoiding Ah, uh, here we're talking about, you know, uh, kind of depression or the giving up. You know, you've, you've, you've participated in the discussion. It didn't go well. It's, you want to protect yourself from that feeling, and so you decide, I'm going to let it go. Uh, and save time. And save time. And thank you. Competition, <laughs> where one person 
says, I'm going to use dominance and power, and I'm going to make this decision for you. This conflict will hereby be ended by the sledgehammer approach. This works sometimes if you've tried methods and they failed. You might need a decision like this. If it's an emergency, you have to have a quick resolution, and there is no time for debate, then sometimes this is appropriate. Or, and I have one, I knew I was going to take a versus KDE. Yes, I knew it. Um, in situations where an unpopular decision has to be made. So back in the day, in 2003, I think, my startup was acquired by Novell. So my startup, Zimian, we were, oh, Pino knows Pino's my best KDE friend. <laughs> we were the, we were founded by the founder of the GNOME project. So we were a GNOME shop. Novell acquired us. The Linux desktop is the future. We said, yes, we know. Then we acquired SUSE. And we said, we thought the Linux desktop was the future and you were going to go with GNOME. And uh, they said, well, yes, we have GNOME, we have KDE, and we're going to make a decision. And you know what? <laughs> you do know, right? <laughs> they didn't make a decision. Uh, a bunch of us quit within three years. Yes. <laughs> to scattered applause. Can I have a question regarding the previous one? Yeah, a question about. You gotta watch. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can help you guys at least acknowledge you heard them and um, you, you take their feedback, but you're not gonna address right now and maybe in the future. Then at least they feel heard and less overruled. So I'm not sure because it, it resembles a bit, you know, saying, I hear you, but this is something that I, in my catalog, I, I don't do. Like the moment I write somewhere in the comments, I hear you, but I, yeah. I failed as a, as a person. So I don't want to do this. But at the same time, the way I'm treating them is not good either. So.
this was a discussion for our streaming friends about, about the role of a decision maker when they've made a decision, but they still want to encourage communication because they're hoping to generate buy-in. So the last strategy for us to talk about, can you believe we have five minutes and 28 seconds left? So much for breaking you into groups and making you resolve conflicts together. You guys dodged the bullet there. All right, collaboration. This is a win-win. We both worked together. We found a beautiful solution. But it is difficult, and it takes a lot of time. It's not always appropriate. It's appropriate when you're trying to get at the root of a problem that's gone on for a long time. You've tried all these other strategies. They haven't resolved the ultimate problem that continues to occur. The tacos versus pizza problem has never gone away. And Sergey and I decide we're going to make lunch from now on, right? But you need everyone involved to be willing to investigate alternative solutions that they haven't necessarily thought of. So they have to be willing to say, I'm not looking for fame and glory for my decision here. And these are kind of some of the reasons that doing collaboration can be difficult. When our ego comes and says, I hope they pick mine because I am the best, they should know, makes it hard to collaborate. So we're running out of time. I will send my strategies to, or not my strategies, I'll send my slides to the DevConf organizers. So if you ever want to look up anything, you'll have them here. I thought it would be helpful for you if I gave you uh, a summary of four different conflict types, what works well and what doesn't work well, but I suspect you can all read. Since we have only three minutes left, I'm not going to read this to you. I guess for our last three minutes, um, what would you like to share? Have you thought of a conflict you wanted to talk about? Have you got any feedback? Never do this again, Anna. Uh, anything on your minds? Yes. Alexander. I think that most of the conflict, even most of the conflicts we have here, even though they are quite complex to discuss, they are complex. Yeah. That we know them, we are like moved to transition into the next stage. And you left me wondering whether conflicts ever <laughs> I, I think there's just a forgotten stage in it. <laughs> Some sort of transition into it. But it uh, like really this reasoning doesn't really you see the overarching conflict, just the individual stages of it. Like you take three minutes to cool down, you name it like the three minutes to go grab a shotgun, and now you're in an entirely different art. <laughs> So next time around, we'll work on Alex point about what what happens when we are really moving our conflict down the road. Change our personal investment. Maybe over time something looks healthier. Maybe we do build something together where we agree. Maybe external circumstances change the shape of our conflict. It won't always continue on and on. Yes. Accommodation doesn't work well. So accommodation is where one party lets the other party win, yeah. right? So if I am having a conflict with the state of Michigan, where I live, right? So if the state of Michigan were going to decide, oh, okay, Anna Syed, you win in this case. Uh, this, this just rarely, rarely happens. It creates a precedent of unfairness. It weakens the complete organizational system. Accommodation allowing one-offs is not usually the best way to resolve this. 
Yeah. 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 All right. Oh, our last comment with 39 seconds left. What do you have? Okay, let's see if I can summarize. Uh, how would you foster and nurture this culture of uh, conflict resolution in a team that may be challenging at times? Do you think training, having team training would be helpful or how, how would you approach I would model. So the question here was about my poor friend Petter has to keep showing me this. Thank you so much willing, Petter. Uh, Petter is saying, repeat the question. The question was um, how to get a team or a group to learn conflict resolution strategies over time. One of them is verbosely model these strategies. Say out loud what you're doing. You can be the one showing fairness. You can say what you're doing. That's one. Training, yeah. A bunch of trainings exist. Um, if you're a red hatter, there's, oh, what do they call it? Crucial Conversations, mm -hmm. right? You can take a red hat course called Crucial Conversations. LinkedIn has courses about this. There are a bunch of books. You said Aaron Meyer something culture. Culture map. Culture map. Our friend here gave gave you. So I would say provide learning resources, recognizing that different people appreciate different strategies and come from different backgrounds. Oh, we're 48 seconds over. All right. <laughs> it was really beautiful to see you today. If I made some mistakes, please forgive me. It was just a pleasure to have your company. So thanks for coming. Thank you.